Good morning. Welcome to the East Canton Church of God. We are so glad that you're here. Um, we love to connect, so don't forget the welcome cards in the pew pockets. Um, we get to continue our worship uh, this morning as we give our, our tithes and our offerings. And that can be done online or on your way out as you leave this morning. Just opportunities for us to be so thankful for what God is doing in our lives. So just a few announcements. Young adults, you're headed to Arrowhead Orchard today. Uh, so enjoy that and have fun. You're meeting right after church. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you'll have more instructions from there. But don't miss that, young adults. Um, also, um, an update on uh, the progress of the house next door. So we had a work day on Wednesday, uh, and we got the dumpster uh, filled to a nice level. That was good. A lot of dust and, and things for us to pitch and sort and clean. So thank you for those who have helped. We have another work day that is scheduled for this Wednesday. We were going to schedule it at 5, but we made so much progress, and we've had a couple little... Um, worker bees that have been working throughout the week that I'll send an email out that says what time but it, it probably will be around six I think in a half an hour if we have enough help we could probably finish off that dumpster and uh, finish off what needs to be done in the house so we won't be starting at five it'll probably be at six but I'll send a confirmation out through email if you're not on the email list you need to let the church office know so you can get those communications um, also, um, pumpkin rolls are on sale, and the youth will be making those this weekend, um, so be praying for us, okay? 250 pounds of powdered sugar, yeah. All right, 63 dozen eggs, yes. Um, the seniors are headed to the Star Theater on October 20th, and that's to see the Book of Ruth. There's a sign-up in the Welcome Center, so make sure, seniors, that you do that. We are mobilizing for Thanksgiving baskets, so in your worship folder is a list of benevolence items. Uh, so this is another way for us to serve in our community, so uh, check that out and see a need, fill a need. If you will join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that on this bright Sunday morning we can come together and worship you. God, I pray for Matt as he brings the message this morning. We just pray that you will fill his heart so that his words come from you. We just pray that you'll indwell in our hearts as we listen and we grow and we have the opportunity to learn. And that we will take that and apply it in our lives. And we just praise you, God, for who you are. God, you are so good to us. And we are so thankful that you're in control. We just pray that as you guide our steps this week, that we point directly back to you. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you'll stand and greet each other. Good morning, church. As we come together, this is our opportunity to praise. This is our opportunity to come to God and thank him for everything that he's done in our lives. As we go through the songs today, everything that we have focuses around a story. It focuses around the story of God and the story of what he has brought through Jesus into our lives. And this, to start off with, is our opportunity to thank God for the story and our salvation that he's brought to us.
try with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond and Just when I ran out of the road I met a man I didn't know He told me that I was not Ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends. Burden with bitterness. You can't just keep it moving. Nah, no, you ain't welcome here. Now, till I walk the streets of gold, I'll sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found. Another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. And I lost another one, I am free, I am free. Are you free? And I lost another one. As we continue to, to thank God for the story that he's brought into our lives and how that can reflect together in the story of this church and salvation and everything together. We just, we want to come together and remember that we have that story that we can share with others around us on a day-to-day -day basis. And we do that through remembering the blessed assurance that we have of our personal testimony that God has brought into our lives, each individually, how he has helped us through everything that we've been through and how we have that opportunity to share with others.
if you'll center your hearts around a time of prayer as we lead into our prayer as a congregation this morning. I ask that if you've got something that God's laid on your heart right now, if he's calling you to, step out of that comfort zone, out of that normal place where we all just are standing here and continuing to sing. And if he's calling you to, the altars are always open here. You can come up and you can pray on your own. When we get to the end of the song, we'll come together as a congregation and we'll pray as a congregation. But just as God's leading you this morning, I just bring that you bring that heart of prayer out to them. continue in this attitude of worship because God is worthy of it all. When you think about your week and all the many blessings that you've had, we've lived this week in a way that people that are south of us have lost their way of living and he is worthy of our praise. We want to praise him for who he is. He is sovereign over it all. This hurricane didn't surprise him. But I hope what he is surprised by is our response to those people that are in need, Uh, our prayers, our money, and maybe even our hands and feet are where we can worship him and show him how we love him and how we love his people. Would you bow with me in prayer? God, you are worthy of it all worthy of it all. We think about, Father God, your creation and how you created it perfectly. You created the sun, the moon, the skies, the stars, the earth, the trees, the water, the oceans, the animals, the birds, the things that are creepy crawly under the earth, those things that are in the ocean. And you created mankind. You created them perfectly. And we praise you, Father, for who you are, 
For your great love, you made this creation to be a perfect place. Father God, we know that as people, as human beings, we have fallen short of that glory. And we've turned from your ways to our own wicked ways. We have thought of ourselves above you and above others. And we confess that this morning. We are prone to selfishness and pride that makes ourselves number one and everybody else somewhere else below that. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would forgive us when we have not given you the proper place in our life, when we have not lifted you up to the throne that you are sitting on, but have brought you down to our level and made you into a God we want you to be. We thank you that you haven't done that, that you have remained on the throne, and that you are sovereign over all the earth, that you have seen everything from the beginning and know everything to the end, because you are God and you are worthy of it all. We just praise you this morning. We confess, Father God, that we fall short, but we are so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and walked on this earth as one of us, yet without sin. And that he sacrificed his life on a cross and shed his blood so that that blood could cover our sins. That we might receive that offering of grace and mercy that you have given to us. That we can receive you into our lives. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you for his blood. We thank you for the, that he died, he rose again and that he is seated right now at your right hand and that he makes intercession for each one of us. He knows us by name and he calls it out to God and he intercedes for us and we're so thankful and grateful for that. And we are so thankful, Father, for the Holy Spirit that comes and indwells us when we receive you as our Lord and Savior. We thank you that we can be like the vine and the branch, that we are our Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and what he has, he puts into us that we can live out that life of Jesus Christ because of him within us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that makes that known to us, that lives that out through us, that protects us, that guides us, but also convicts us when we fall short, convicts us when we think of ourselves more higher than anybody else. He convicts us when we are selfish and prideful. He convicts us when we fall away from you. And so we thank you for that Holy Spirit who keeps us and watches over us and guides us. You are such a good God that you care for all of us. We thank you, Father God, for the many things that you have given to us. We thank you for the sun and the moon. We thank you for the earth. We thank you for the animals. and all those things that we take for granted, but we thank you most of all for who you are. We thank you that we can come to church this morning and that we can praise you. We thank you that we can lift up your name in freedom, that this country is still a place where we can freely worship and that we can come into places and gather together and lift up the name of Jesus. We thank you that we live in this country. We thank you, Father, for our pastor and for this church. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with Pastor Greg as he travels home. We pray, Heavenly Father, that he and Sherry would have a safe flight and that everything would go well. We pray, Heavenly Father, and thank you for this church that has stood on this corner for uh, many years, over 50 years, and has pro pronounced to this town, this village, and even across the world, the name of Jesus. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the privilege that we have to even grow. It is because of you that that happens. It is because you are working in the hearts of men and women and children that this church is growing. We thank you for your, your mercy and your grace that has allowed that to happen here in East Canton. And Heavenly Father, we bring to you many of our requests because we do have them. And your word says that we can come boldly to the throne and present our request to you. And so, Father, we lift up these names to you and ask for your divine touch upon their lives, healing of their bodies, healing of their minds, healing of their finances, 
you know what they need more than we do. And so we just lift up these names to you and ask for you to intervene in their lives. We think of, of Adriana Stewart, Ken Gilbertson, Terry Moore, Cheryl Jones, Eladio Santiago, Catherine Flodo, Becky Du Bois, Ray Wall, Preston Bale, Tim Henry, Mike Geegan, Joanne Bauer, Steve Brooks, Brenda Johnson, Linda Noggle, Howard Deal, Bob and Dina Rowe, Shannon Hostetler, Ken Earhart, Tracy Murphy, and Ron Vance. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just touch their lives. And we praise you for what you are doing in their lives, for whatever healing you are providing for them. We thank you and praise you. We pray for the families suffering in eastern Tennessee and western northern North Carolina. We pray, Heavenly Father, that out of your abundance, out of your people, that needs will be met. We cannot imagine the devastation as we sit here in the sunshine today. We cannot imagine the devastation of losing completely our home, our not being able to have even a, a drink of water. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as you are not a poor God, you are a rich God, and you work through your people, that those needs would be met according to your riches and glory. We pray for, uh, for the Sunday school teachers and our leaders. We pray, Heavenly Father, you know each one of them, and you know the work that they put into their lessons and into their teaching. We pray a blessing upon each one of them and ask that you would continue to lead and guide them. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our junior church teachers and their helpers. We pray also for them, Father, as they teach our children, Father God, the word of God. We pray that they would hear that word and that would be so much a part of their lives that when they grow older, they will not forget it. We pray for our youth leaders. Uh, pray for Pastor Jenny and Steve and Nathan and Kristen uh, Butler and Brian Dean. We pray for each one of them, Father God, because they have a hard job. They, not that our teens are awful, they are not. They are blessed and we are proud of them. But because the culture they live in is hard and we want them, Father God, to remember who you are as they grow through high school, junior high, and even into college. We want them to remember your words. So we pray for their leaders, that they would have the wisdom and the knowledge to teach and lead these young people in the direction that brings glory to your name because you are worthy of it all. We pray for our benevolence team and we pray for Hannah's house. We lift these up to you, Father God, and ask for your hand to be upon it. This world is in trouble and we see it every day, but you are not confounded by it. You are not surprised by it. You are sovereign over all and your will, your will will work out in this in this uh, life of ours, even into um, eternity, your will will be done. And so we just praise you this morning. We ask, Father God, also that you would anoint Matthew as he comes up and preaches your word this morning. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your words would fall from his mouth as you would have them to fall, and that he would trust that you are with, it, with him as he, as he preaches this morning. We also pray, Father, that our ears and our hearts would be open and that we, we, we would receive from you what we need to hear so that our lives will be transformed and we would become more like your son, Jesus. And in all of these things, we give you praise and glory. Amen. Well, I'm excited, ecstatic to be able to announce our speaker this morning one of our very own, um, and that comes because this church is a church that um, pours into leaders, and this church is a church that mentors leaders, and so through Pastor Greg's mentorship and um, Matt demonstrating a will willingness to be mentored, but even greater than that is the exciting journey that we get to share with Matt, and that journey is that there are not very many students who look at their call that God has in their life and try to discern what that is at this stage in life. I mean, there really aren't a lot that are at a place where they're ready to do that. And Matt is one of them. And so 
over the last couple of years, I've been blessed to watch him work through God's call. And while he doesn't have every single detail yet, um, it's clear that God has gifted him with the ability to speak um, and the, a great ability for leadership. And, and I can speak from experience that, you know, Matt has led not only here as a student leader at the church level, but he has served well and represented Jesus in great ways at the district level. And he has been an integral part of the team at the state level. And he has demonstrated leadership qualities through all of that that God has given him. And so I'm very excited to be able to introduce Matt um, to bring our message this morning. And uh, Matt, we're really proud of you. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the uh, introduction. As Jenny said, I have like a call to ministry on my life, so I'm interested in going into either missions field or preaching or whatever God has for me. Um, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to speak in front of you. Um, thank you for Pastor Jenny and Pastor Greg for that. Um, when I was preparing this message, I started about a month ago, and Pastor Greg's been helping me through it, and he gave me a book to read that's like how he preaches his sermons, right? So the way the book says to write a sermon is instead of making an outline, like a list of things to follow, you want to find your destination, and you want to find where you're starting, and then you make a map to get there, right? The problem with that is I am notoriously navigationally challenged which means I can get lost in my own neighborhood. And I actually did once. Um, we, had a, uh, we had a Christmas DU, and we were going around looking for Christmas lights. And I was like, oh, I know where Christmas lights were. And I think I was in Jenny's car. Um, the problem was I thought I knew where Christmas lights were. I didn't know where Christmas lights were. I knew where some dead ends were. Um, so we end up going down a lot of dead end roads. We end up, I think we had to use Google Maps to get out of it. Um, but actually that wasn't even the first time I've gotten lost. The first time I got lost majorly, I was six years old in downtown Akron. Um, so we were there for the All American Soapbox Derby, which is like the uh, world championship event. And it's held in Akron, Ohio. And the, le the week leading up to it, there's kind of like parades and smaller races, things like that. And uh, so we were at the parade the first day, and I wasn't even in the race, but I guess I was just a cute kid or something because they put me on the parade. Um, we were relatively, like me and my brother were in it, we were relatively soon in the parade, so we were like done by the time the parade was still going on. So we were kind of just waiting at the end of the parade, and uh, my dad was talking to uh, some other dads, and my brother was talking to some of his friends. I didn't really know anybody, though, and I was bored, and my mom had food, and I was hungry, so I was waiting there for a minute. I waited and waited, and I was like, you know, I saw my mom when we were doing the parade, right? So I know where she is, vaguely, so why don't I just walk back to her, you know? It's not that far. So, um, Basically, after thinking about it for a few minutes, I was like, yeah, I got it. I start walking back to her, or where I thought she was at least. <clears throat> the problem was the truck had come down, like the truck we were on the back of during the parade had come down and then turned around. So what I thought the right side of the road was the left side of the road. So I'm walking down the sidewalk. I get to where I think she should be, and she's not there. So I keep walking, still not there. I walked so far that I actually got back to where the parade started. And then I turn around, I'm like, okay, maybe I just missed her. So I start walking back. I walk all the way back to where the truck was. And I was like, okay, well, at least my dad will be here, you know? He's probably still talking. He wasn't. Um, so now I'm like, okay, I'm actually lost. I'm six years old. There should be a picture of how large I was at that point in time on the screen. Yeah, so I was a small person. I was like 45 pounds max. I, I could probably just pick myself up like this, like easily kidnappable. Um, so I'm just walking, I'm freaking out. I'm like, God, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. I'm sorry, I should have stayed with him. And I'm praying. 
really freaking out. Uh, about five minutes later, because I'm just walking up and down the road looking, about five minutes later, I hear a voice from the other side of the road, right? Because I thought, you know, oh, maybe my mom's over there. I can't get over there, though, because this is the side I'm on. This is the side my mom's on, and there's a parade in the middle, all right? And the parade's on a road, and I was six years old. I had been taught not to walk across a road without an adult's hand, right? But I'd also been taught never talk to strangers. So I didn't know any adults on my side of the road, but I needed an adult to get to the other side of the road. So it was, it was really a predicament. Um, fortunately, I heard a voice on the other side, and it was my dad. So my dad is over here. I've established that my parents are on the other side of the road, right? But I'm still over here, and there's still this chasm in the middle I can't cross, right? I can't get across the middle, but my dad can. So my dad, even though I walked away from him, had enough grace to come from his side over to mine so he could walk me back over and get me back in my father's presence. So, how do we get back into our father's presence, right? Pa last week, Pastor Greg talked about uh, what heaven's like, kind of um, just a picture of what heaven would look like. You know, the streets are made of gold, gold so clear it looks like glass. And uh, this actually works well with what I'm talking about today, because I'm talking about how do we get to heaven. And when I say get to heaven, I don't just mean, oh, I just want to go to heaven. I don't care about relationship with God. I mean, get back into God's presence, which is in heaven, right? So that's the question. How do we get back into our Father's presence? Have there been points in your life where you have been too focused on what you are doing to get to heaven and not enough focused on how your relationship with God is? Because if you don't have a relationship with God, what's the point of going to heaven, right? That's the whole thing. So I'm going to read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, if you guys will stand with me and turn in your Bibles to there. All right. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we once all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raising us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You may be seated. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to break that down a little bit because if we just read and don't like pay attention to what's actually saying in each part, then it's not really going to make any sense. But the first three verses kind of talk about we are dead in sin. We're dead. It says, verse 1, and you were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked, right? We lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and mind, right? So we were not good. We were dead in our trespasses. That's where we were. But then it goes on. Verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Right? So first we're dead. Now we're alive with Christ. Right? By grace. Okay? So, in your notes, we are saved by grace. All right? <laughs> so, but then verse 8 talks about faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not a result of works so that no one may boast. So, you're saved by grace and then you receive it through your faith, right? 
So John Wesley, um, he's the guy who founded the holiness movement and also the Methodist church. Um, the Church of God comes out of the holiness movement, so we kind of come from this guy's thoughts and beliefs. He said that genuine faith produces inward and outward holiness. The regenerative process inwardly cannot help but find expression in an improved moral character outwardly. So I'm going to read that again. Genuine faith produces inward and outward holiness. The regenerative process inwardly cannot help but escape and find expression and prove moral character, right? So what's inside can't help but get out. You can't help but show the change in your life to others around you, right? So I was at the, uh, the men's retreat last Friday night. I couldn't stay for Saturday, but I was there Friday night, and the uh, speaker, Wayne Wiseman, talked about how we house the Spirit of God. And I tend to like to make images in my head. You know, I have like a photographic memory. I try and like make pictures in my head of everything. So when I heard we house God's spirit, I immediately went to Jesus sent a house, right? And I started thinking about it, like, what does the outside of that house look like? If we house God and he lives in our house, what does the outside of that house look like? Because you know, when you're driving like, you're just driving along, you see houses along the side of the road, you can kind of tell who has money a little bit, right? You see these massive, like, three-story mansions, and they're, like, massive yards. It's like, oh, yeah, they, they probably have some money. You know, it's, you can tell who lives in the house by what's on the outside. And it's the same for us. You can tell who lives in our heart by what we look like on the outside. And I'm not saying you have to have a three-story mansion. I'm just saying that you have to reflect God's character on your outside, Right? So we're going to go to James 2, verse 14. I'm going to give you a second to turn there, and I'm also going to turn there. Um, this is when James talks about faith without works is dead, right? So verse 14. What is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things for the body, what good is it that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. We're going to pause there for a second. So what James is saying here is imagine somebody goes to a soup kitchen, right? And they're like, can I have some soup? I need soup. Um, I'm hungry. I need food. If the person at the soup kitchen was like, oh, go be filled and didn't give them any soup, what help would that be, right? They're not, you're not feeding them. You're just saying, go do this, right? You're not actually doing any works to help them. So we're going to pick up back in verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In some ways, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also is faith apart from works dead. Right? <clears throat> so what James is saying here, this verse can kind of be easily misconstrued a little bit, saying that works kind of do get you heaven, like you need works to get you heaven. But what James is actually saying is that you can have works without faith, and that's just being a good person, right? Plenty of people have works without faith, you know? That's, like, what most of charity is and, like, caring for the environment. It's just people wanting to do good for others because it feels good to them, right? There's no faith involved in that. And that's 
that doesn't get you to heaven. You can be the best person ever, but all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. So you're not going to get to heaven based on those works, right? And you can have faith without works, but that's just being a dead Christian, you know? That's not real faith. That's a dead faith. And that's the distinction James is making in this chapter. What's the difference between a dead faith and a living faith? So James is not saying here that works equals faith. They do not equal the same thing. Like if you have works, that does not mean you have faith. And if you have faith, that does not mean you get works, right? But he is also not contradicting Paul by saying that faith is not what saves you. He's saying that you cannot be saved by a dead faith, right? But living faith saves us. So faith is still what saves us. Grace through faith is what saves us. And then we add works to make it a living faith, right? And we don't have to do this alone, okay? God sent a helper for us. The Holy Spirit is here for us, right? So in John 16, verses 7 through 15, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Because of the Holy Spirit of truth, we know what is right and wrong. The Holy Spirit helps us find out what is right, what the good works we need to do are, right? So in your notes, first we are saved by grace. Then... We are transformed by it to live out an active faith through good works, right? Your faith is not an active living faith without the good works. So, have you received his grace and put your faith in him? Can those around you see your faith through your works, right? So, are you a mirror of Jesus? Are you a reflection of how does your house look that Jesus lives in, right? What's the lawn like? Is the siding fresh and painted? Or is it kind of caving in, you know? Like, what does that house look like? What do other people see? When you leave church on Sunday and go work on Monday, what are you like? Can people see that you're a Christian? We, I think we all know those Christians that you hear that they're Christian later, and at first you would have never guessed, Right? So you, you're friends with them for a while, you know, they're like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, by the way. And it's like, really? <laughs> you know, like, you never would guess. You don't want to be that Christian. And it's easy to be that Christian, right? That's the point. The devil tries to make it as easy as possible for us to be that dead Christian. But that's not the way we should live, right? We need to actively show Christ as a reflection in us. I'm going to have the worship team come up now. Um, I just have one more point. Grace is not an on-your-own thing, right? Paul says in verse 10, I haven't really talked about this too much, that we are his workmanship. We are creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. So when he's talking about our salvation, he always uses the word you, right? But when he talks about the good works we do together, he says, we. That's because we are one body. We need to work together. You know, it says, without the eye, what good is the ear? You can't function as a body without each other. So we need to do these good works together. So, lastly, in your notes, first we are saved by grace, then we are transformed by it to do good works together. It's not on your own thing. Thank you.
please stand. As you go today, remember to receive his grace, live out an act of faith, and do it together. Go in his peace.